it started or it seemed to start at a school board meeting in Loudoun County, Virginia. During the political comment section of the meeting, people lined up to declare their opposition to the teaching of critical race theory in their schools. People were angry. They inspired others in the room to be angry too, even those who'd never heard of critical race theory. The next month, the crowd got larger and more heated. They accused the school district of installing racist curricula and teaching children to be ashamed of being white. They aligned critical race theory with Marxism and socialism and swore to fight it with their last breaths. Similar fights broke out in school board meetings across the nation, unless you think this is a Southern or a Midwestern thing. Westchester County school boards have been inundated with the same furious rhetoric. The chair of the school district where I live was threatened with violence for trying to bring reason to a dangerously angry crowd in my own hometown. This is a really kind and gentle woman with a doctorate in education and, and is a volunteer. And yet they threatened her family. A video of a woman in Carmel, New York, which is the town where Community Church owned a retreat house until fairly recently. That video went viral displaying this woman's well-mannered critique of critical race theory during a school board meeting. And the 1619 project seemed to be at the center of her argument. She was demonstrating, she said, her conviction that social justice warriors and Black Lives Matter activists are telling her young children that they are racist and shameful because they're white. Critical race theory is, or was an obscure, but interesting idea of a law professor. He had it in the 1980s. Um, he asked his Harvard Law students to critique every law on how it helped or hurt people of color. It was a pedagogical tool that wasn't used as far as he knows much outside the school. Really, he just hoped that it would give lawyers and those crafting new laws a lens for understanding the American legal system. It's an academic framework suggesting that racism is systemic, devoid of personality and embedded into our legal systems and institutions. No one had heard about it until spring of 2021. It's just about a year ago when a conservative pundit started talking on Fox News about the conspiracy of teaching critical race theory in our schools not at Harvard Law School, he started talking about teaching it to elementary school kids and high school kids, but he was targeting little kids. Of course, no one had heard of it yet, except for his complaining about it. So between March and June of 2021, critical race theory was mentioned more than 2,000 times on Fox News. People were being told that critical race theory was being taught in their schools and they needed to stop it and save their children. Critical race theory is often partnered with the 1619 Project created by Nicole Hannah-Jones, the multi-award winning journalist. Her groundbreaking work decentering the white story in our history and instead placing the black experience at the center of the narrative has transformed the way millions of Americans understand our past and present. Here in New York, we like to talk about the landing of the Mayflower in 1620 as the beginning. In Virginia, they talk about Jamestown, a colony that started in 1607. And if you live in Florida, you're gonna cite St. Augustine founded in 1565. Hannah Jones starts in 1619 when the white lion arrived in Virginia carrying enslaved people. After her groundbreaking work of expanding our story, Hannah Jones was hired by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to teach journalism. Having gone through the process, she was formally recommended for tenure, which the Board of Trustees reneged, citing unambiguously her work to quote, rewriting history and promoting racism in our schools. 
The public outcry both on campus and around the country was powerful and the offer was back on the table when Hannah Jones left Chapel Hill for a prestigious appointment at Howard University, which is where she is now. The 1619 project marked the 400th anniversary of black people being brought to this land in chains. It was a podcast and a series of articles published by the New York Times. It's since become a book and a curriculum. The project was the creation of a new American narrative that decentered white people, placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of Black Americans at the center of the story. Before this groundbreaking work, Black people were rarely mentioned in the popular telling of our history other than the offhanded mention that some of our revered leaders owned slaves. And that's how it was said, owned slaves, as if the people were inherently slaves and Washington, Jefferson, and Madison were just their owners rather than the people who caused the state of enslavement. For the most part, <clears throat> we don't, we rarely talk about Black people in American history before the Civil War. Even then, we focus on a handful of people we see as extraordinary, like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, while ignoring the life experience of millions of people. We pick up the story again during the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. And honestly, I don't even know how much elementary schools or high schools do that, but, but somehow in the popular narrative, we'll pick up the Harlem Renaissance and then we put it down again and we pick it up again uh, during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Otherwise the American story is told as a white story with people of color playing a minor or supporting role. Americans tend to think about our history as generally good, something to be proud of, a force for hope in the world. We excuse our heroes for being slaveholders without recognizing that those men couldn't have been who they were without human trafficking or the destruction of families, without exploitation of black labor, labor guaranteed through torture. Our beloved founders made their living by enslaving people. This isn't to say that they should be dismissed or canceled. It's to say that the story is larger and more complex than we've been comfortable with. And it's time to expand the American capacity for truth. The culture war has become a fight for the American story. Nicole Hannah Jones notes that when she writes about abuses of living people in her investigative journalism, she doesn't get the same level of pushback as when she writes about people who are long dead. The fight over our history is fiercer than the fight over living people's current actions. Why would that be? Why are people howling at school board meetings terrified that their children are learning American history from something other than the white perspective? Evidence suggests that Americans are willfully opposed to grappling with our own history. Why? George F. Will, the conservative commentator, wrote in the Washington Post, I think it was last summer, that the 1619 project was intended to, and I'm quoting him, displace the nation's actual founding, thereby draining from America's story the moral majesty of the first modern nation's enlightenment precepts. He goes on to center white people in the abolition and civil rights movements, ultimately dismissing the entire 1619 project. And he wasn't alone. Five historians wrote a detailed letter with their you know, reservations, one of which is that the entire project was driven by ideology as if centering blackness is more ideological than centering whiteness. So why the fight for our history? I think it's because we find hope in the narrative we've all been taught. The story we've been told and have repeated again and again is one of triumph. We know that we've stumbled, that not everyone is perfect, that not everything happened as quickly as we wish, but ultimately we are fine. We are a good and moral country, an enviable country. And in the end, everything always works out for the best. The traditional American story notes offhandedly that the slave trade was part of our economic system, but then we ended it. There were some struggles, mostly in the South, but then we all came together for an exciting nonviolent movement and we came to our senses, a fact 
we white people can prove we can prove we came to our senses because we white people elected a black president barack obama was our absolution and with him we were done everything worked out and 2008 was when it was all finished we're now post history and if you're talking about race you're just causing trouble the questions around who tells our story or how our story is told have the potential to dethrone us. We are the city on a hill, the moral compass for the world. If we don't deserve that status, if we weren't chosen by God, who are we? Not a question we're gonna ask. We're Americans, we know our power. We've written a story to prove it. There's so much privilege in being the people who choose the story. The McMinn County Board of Education in Tennessee banned the book Mouse to a 10-0 vote. Not, they say, because it confronts anti-Semitism, but because they want to protect children from the cartoon image of a naked mouse. In Katy, Texas, they're removing books that talk about racism, all written by Black authors for Black children for the stated reason that these books teach critical race theory, although none of the authors had ever heard that term before last year. Other recent targets are All Boys Aren't Blue, Lawn Boy, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, all about race, gender, and sexuality. Other current books being banned include uh, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, Fahrenheit 451, which ironically is about book banning, the Hate You Give, The Color Purple, George Orwell's Animal Farm, and the Harry Potter series with one pastor telling his congregants not to let their children read the books out loud. I am not kidding you here. He says, don't read them out loud because the spells are real. Wanting to limit or control what people know and think about is as old as human history, but in a nation which institutionalized free speech and religion and a free press right from the beginning, this practice seems particularly egregious and frankly un-American. Or maybe it's as American as it gets. Maybe we just don't want to admit it. The narrative we've been telling ourselves and teaching our children so they are sure to tell it to themselves and teach it to their children is that the story of the white people is the whole story. No one else, no other experiences are relevant. The we in our stories is white people. The heroes are white. The victories are white. Even the losses are white. The story has belonged to white people from the time Columbus landed and declared himself the founder of two continents on which 75 million people lived. Only white stories matter. Now, as a student of history, I know well that History is a series of stories, not a comprehensive collection of facts. This nation's story has been told so many times. We have trouble imagining ourselves in any other way. We embed the story into our cultural consciousness so deeply, we have trouble seeing it. There's a fourth grade assignment in every school across the nation. Children are told to go home and find out who their ancestors were going back three, maybe four generations and to find out what country they came from. It's often part of the assignment to then research the country and present something about it to the class. We're so close to the European immigrant experience. We can't see the privilege of narrative that assignment assumes. Being made invisible is oppressive. Having your story forgotten, your ancestors lost, your history marginalized or neglected completely is generational abuse. It's also terribly limiting for everyone, not just those people whose story isn't told, because really there's only one story. None of us live outside the single web of existence. We have one story, but we've chosen just to tell a part of it. And the reasons aren't a mystery. The parents at the school board meeting are clear. They're angry, they say, because their children are being taught to be ashamed. I can tell you as a parent, as a person raising a white boy, a child who's going to become a white man, giving him the full story has only empowered him. 
He's never expressed shame, but instead he's demonstrated resolve to become part of a new story, one that creates a world better than the one he's inheriting. This isn't someone else's story. This is his story. This is our story. It's our national story. We have one story. And it includes St. Augustine and Jamestown and the Mayflower and the White Lion. It includes Virginia Dare and the first white child, sorry, Virginia Dare was the first white child born and William Tucker, the first black child born on this land. It includes Elijah Graves Otis, the white inventor of the elevator and Alexander Miles, the black inventor who made it automatic rather than manual. It includes Katherine Johnson, the Nassau mathematician, without whom Alan Shepard's space travel would not have been not possible. It includes all of us. And limiting the story minimizes both our brokenness and our victories. We cannot step into greatness without the telling of our full and rich and tawdry and violent and formidable and triumphant and complicated and redemptive story. We are the amalgam of all of it, of all of our ancestors, of all of their immor immorality, of all their brilliance and foresight and work and pain, all of it. It is who we are and embracing it, claiming the narrative, telling our story in its fullness is the next step to our collective liberation.